So welcome to another episode of the Scottish Property Podcast. My name is Nick Ponte. I'm here with Stephen Clark. How are you doing, Stephen? Good, thanks, Nick. Yourself? Brilliant. All good. We've got another good guest on today. We do. We have Fiona Campbell from the Association of Scottish Caterers. Scottish, sorry, Association of Scotland's Self Caterers. Yeah, ah, you get wrong. She's a chief executive, uh, but basically what we thought would be great is she's got a real good insight and a grasp of what's going on at the moment in the world of a lot of our listeners will know as like SA or Airbnb, service department, service accommodations. There's so many buzzwords for it, but basically what it boils down to is self-catering accommodation, which has been about for, well, years. So... Yeah. It's a, it's, a big, it's a big buzzword now in the short-term market as well because of the staycations booming and, and people probably have, have probably pre-COVID probably jumped the ship and put their put their short-term let flat back onto you know long-term PRTs. They're probably already thinking, oh shit, well I put it back to to short term. So yeah, her knowledge and in depth and, and the subject in the sector is phenomenal. And they've done done a lot of good things over over the last year and a half, lobbying for for support for the sector throughout COVID. She breaks into it, and, and you could have got a bit of bashing the, the sector for a wee bit there. But do you know what? It, we, we've, we've said this something times in the Scottish Property Podcast. We like to keep it real and tell the real picture, not the, the fake bullshit way that, that this is what it's meant to look like. She did, she did go into detail about how you need to change your, check your title, change your mortgage, change your insurance and all that stuff. So there's a lot to look into before you, you venture into that sector. And I think what you'll realise from the interview as well, it's not all, you know, 10x in your cash flow from your standard lets, you know, there is a lot of, basically you're going into the hospitality sector, you know, you are a 24 hour concierge, pretty much. Yeah, you're running a hotel, you're running a, uh, yeah, you're running a, you're running a business and a more intensive hands on business, not a, not an investment business where you can park at a long term tenant and kind of forget about it. So yes, yeah, these are these, you've got to weigh these up when looking into that, looking into that sector. Cool. So we'll just launch into the interview with Fiona Campbell. We are delighted to be joined by Fiona Campbell, who is the Chief Executive of the Association of Scotland's self Caterers. Welcome to the podcast, Fiona. How are you doing? Morning. I'm very well indeed, and thanks very much for asking me along today. Yeah, thank you very much for joining us. Good stuff. Okay. Excellent. So Fiona has joined us uh, from Arachel, a beautiful part of the world, just up by Loch Lomond there. So do you want to just give us a quick brief introduction about yourself, uh, Fiona, what you do and uh, what, what your role is at the moment? Sure. Um, I moved up to Arica in 2002, which is, well, several lifetimes ago. Um, and I set up a self-catering house up here. Um, and a, six years ago, I saw an advert for chief executive of the Association of Scotland Self-Caterers. They'd never had one before. And for some reason, I thought it'd be a really good idea to apply. And for some reason, I got the job. So six years later, I represent self-catering in Scotland. Um, that also includes short-term lets or whatever else you want to call it this week. Um, essentially, I have a membership base of 1,300 plus members. We represent probably 20,000 properties in Scotland. And self-catering in Scotland represents £922 million pounds to the Scottish economy. So wow. we represent, yeah, it's it's a big business. We now do an awful lot of lobbying representation because as you'll probably be aware, there's all sorts of new legislation coming on the scene and all sorts of issues. And clearly over the last year, it's been all about COVID and recovery and supporting our members through that whole experience. Cool. So see, in terms of your members, what are we talking about here? What sort of, like, um, you know, property owners, what sort of businesses are we talking about? We have got an incredibly eclectic mix of members. So we've got our people that have got one small cottage in Argyle. We've got people with beautiful high-end apartments in Edinburgh. We've got enormous castles in the highlands. We've got black houses on, on the islands. So we have a really broad range of membership and some of them have one property, some of them have 52. And then of course, we've got agency members as well. So we represent a huge cross section of the sector. And have you seen any kind of like, you know, people who have been sort of traditionally just, you know, buy to let landlords and that now joining your association because they've gone into the space of like Airbnb or service departments and things like that. Is that a market for you guys as well? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I remember doing a talk about four years ago about the benefits of, of 
short term letting versus long term letting. Now, the landscape's obviously changed and especially it's now changing again with the introduction of potential licensing. Um, but it, it, I mean, it's a, it's a great thing to do. It, it's got a higher revenue yield, but at the same time, it comes with all sorts of challenges. One, guests are incredibly high maintenance, especially post COVID. Enormous expectations. Um, we're seeing a real change in guest behavior and consumer insights and trends and so on. So that's that's difficult. Obviously, post COVID, the cleaning routine is enormous. Um, the ASSE wrote the cleaning protocols for the whole of the UK. When I say the ASSE did, I mean, I did that six weeks of my life, I'll never get back. But yeah, so they're incredibly robust and they're brilliant. And it means that people that come to a self-catering property in Scotland are going to be safe and secure, which is fabulous, but it's a lot of work. It takes a lot of time. It costs a lot of money to do. So there are downsides to short-term letting as well as upsides to it. So how long have you been in this kind of business of kind of self-catering then? Like, when did you start? 19 years ago. 19 years, up. right. So wow. You've seen a ago. huge amount of changes in, the, in, the, in that sector in the last 19 years. Then. Unbelievable. I used to have a nice printed brochure, which I would put in an envelope and put a little sticker from Visit Scotland with my star grading on it and post it to people. It was amazing. And people used to phone you up to book and things like that. It was did, like, oh. Did you take the bookings by fax as well? You have a fax machine? <laughs> yes, of course I had a fax machine. Are you mad? I was like so up there with the technology. So obviously, yeah, everything's right, completely right, oh. changed. Yeah, <laughs> virtually. Um, so everything's completely changed. Consumer behavior's completely changed. Obviously, online platforms have completely transformed the whole the landscape of the sector and, and what people expect. And, you know, now, um, if you're not on Airbnb and Booking.com and these people, then you're just not going to be seen. So we're kind of slightly over a barrel in terms of the platforms and OTAs, but it is what it is. And I think you can you can be clever with it and um, use them rather than them using you. I'm assuming this so, is what promoted the, the, the new licenses and regulations that are, are, are probably going to be coming into play. Yeah, I don't know why they're calling it the Short Term Let Licensing Act 2021. It's actually the Airbnb Act 2021. We work really closely with Airbnb, don't get me wrong. Um, Airbnb is not going anywhere. Um, the, the horse has bolted. What we need to do, and I understand their concerns, that what they're trying to achieve, apparently, is ensuring that anybody that stays in self-catering accommodation or short-term let accommodation is safe and the properties are legal. Now, of course, we completely support that, but the narrative that short-term letting is unregulated is lazy at best because we are fully regulated. There's specific health and safety regulations associated with self-catering. So there's specific fire regulations associated with um, self-catering accommodation. We've even got antisocial behavior legislation specifically for holiday lets. So that the, the, the mandatory conditions that the licensing is purporting to address, it is already stuff that we need to be compliant with. But the difficulty is that they're actually conflating a whole bunch of things with this legislation. They're conflating the housing crisis with the health and safety element, et cetera, et cetera. So what they've done is they've completely, they've taken a small item, health and small, one item, health and safety, and they've added all sorts of bolt-ons, which makes the legislation look incredibly unwieldy and frankly, isn't gonna work. So, um, you know, yes, there are issues with people that don't know what they should be complying with, but that's an education and a communication piece. That's not necessarily hammering us all with could, could you run through what's what the compliance is requirements for um, from holiday lets club for the listeners that would that wouldn't know? Can yeah, I just absolutely. can I just jump in before you start that as well, right? Because a lot of our listeners will be sitting uh, listening to this, you know, and they will be just like traditional landlords. They might be thinking, oh, I want to jump in this like Airbnb service department train, you know, which let's face it, most of us will that are not traditionally in the business of providing self-catering accommodation like yourself, we might become exposed to it through a Facebook advert from a training company that says, you can make so much money from 
you know, renting your flat out on Airbnb or as a service department or something like that, right? So this is where people go, ooh, there's a thing, right? So from the kind of- Oh, oh, there, oh there's a thing. You don't need to go on a training course to do it. You really don't. What you should do is join the ASSC clearly and I'll tell you exactly what you need to do. Um, but that's another subject. So what do you need to do? Essentially, the health and safety compliance is more or less exactly the same as a long-term landlord. Exactly the same. The specific fire regulations associated with the health sector, but you know, they're more or less exactly the same as long-term letting. And obviously, there was legislation that was meant to be passed last year to do with domestic dwellings and fire regulations. It's all much of a muchness. So in terms of other things that you need to look at for short-term letting, you need to make sure that your mortgage provider knows you do it. You need to know that your insurance provider is covering it adequately because that is a different issue to private landlords or indeed domestic dwellings. And it's not good enough just to um, believe that Airbnb's insurance policy is going to cover you. It doesn't, simply doesn't. So that's really important. You've got to make sure your title deeds allow it. So especially if you're in a city centre apartment, go look at your title deeds before you even play doing with this. Oh, going back to insurance. For example, if you start airbnb your property, I hate that verb. If you start airbnb your property, it may well be um, making your building insurance void. So you've got to be really careful about what you're doing and, and who you're impacting. So it's, it's simple things like that. But then of course you need your, you know, do your PAT testing, get your EICR done. All of those basic things that any long-term landlord would do and it has to comply with. That's interesting. What would you suggest? Like, I mean, if there was, like Nick was touching on, if, if a long-term, um, you know, rental landlord was thinking about doing a short-term let but wasn't too sure on the market, would you jump through all these hoops and compliant to, to get compliant or, or to, can you get your insurance, your mortgage provider on board before even attempting it? Or would you, t would you test the market, you know, with a, an advert or, you know, I, I, I'm think I'm kind of thinking outside the box. I've had recent conversations recently with guys in my mastermind group and a lot of people are thinking about it. They're seeing a little trend in, the, in, in some market areas where they've got long-term rentals and they're thinking, oh, maybe the short-term rental would actually work. But, you know, changing your insurance and your mortgage provider for for the sake of not getting booked and realizing, okay, it doesn't work in this area, in this this uh, this market. Oh shit! I'm, um, you know. Well, start with step one. Mm. Do your title deed say you can or you explicitly can't? Yeah. That's an easy one. That's a checking. It's not going to cost you anything. Your mortgage provider. There aren't that many mortgage providers that will cover um, holiday lets. One of them is Cumberland. Cumberland Business. They're very very good. They're an English company, but they operate throughout Scotland. But as I say, there aren't that many that are giving out that kind of mortgage at the moment. But again, some mortgages will say that's fine. You can do it. But some will say explicitly no. So don't start doing it. Because you may well be, you know, if you're if you're going against your mortgage yeah. provider, then that's a that's an issue. Um, I guess. If you come across issues like that, insurance is easy enough to get. We work with a fabulous company called Bruce Stevenson that's got the best insurance policy on the market for short-term lets. Um, you know, making sure that you're absolutely covered for everything and including public liability insurance and so on and so forth. And these days you need public liability insurance for 10 million, not 5 million, because people are much more likely to cause you difficulties so you know you want to be covered off there's no point in doing this half-heartedly and that's why short-term lessing is not this kind of like easy option that everybody yeah. thinks is i've got a limit. sorry fiona i've got just while you're talking about insurance there like it just brought back a little memory so i've got a limited experience of doing i'm probably one of those kind of like landlords that says oh I'll, I'll airbnb my properties and kind of jumped on the bandwagon right i totally admit it hold my hands up uh, like I did actually have a little bit of experience. Like I come from like a, a upbringing where I was brought up in a hotel. Like mum and dad had a hotel uh, growing up and all the rest of it. And we had a B&B as well. So I did have a little bit of experience uh, about looking after guests and providing service and that for people. But anyway, going back to your insurance point, I got a... I, I, like how you, I like how you gave the disclaimer that you're not a charlatan, but if you want to before you, <laughs> sorry. 
My properties were in good condition. They were well maintained. I'm a responsible landlord. Everything was good. Uh, anyway, like one of my flats overlooks the back of the SECC in Glasgow. Obviously, it attracts people, young people who are coming for gigs, concerts, and all the rest of it. I had a group of four girls in from Dundee, I think it was, and uh, they they stayed for the weekend. And they sent me a picture of the radiator which fell off the wall, and there was like. Oh, right, that's quite bad, but it didn't look like that bad. I mean, it literally had fallen off the wall and you can just put it back on the brackets again. Like, and it's quite a small radiator. Anyway, went round, sorted it out and all that, no problem. Uh, about two weeks down the line or three weeks, I got a letter through from uh, uh, one of these uh, solicitors, but you know these ones that you hear advertising the radio, like uh, no win, no fee, we'll chase your... Uh, personal injury claims and all the rest of it. It was like one of them basically saying that uh, one of them had sustained injuries. They had a full medical report and they were wanting to basically sue me. And I was like, oh my God. Like, <laughs> but like they didn't show me, any, show me any injuries at the time. There was like no like drama, no hospitalization or anything like that. But then they followed this up later down the line and I was like, oh my God. Anyway, I was advised to ignore it. Um, which I don't know if the, that's the right advice, by the way, I'm not giving advice here, but I ignored it and nothing ever came of it. But it just shows you that people, you know, some, I think they call them ambulance chasers, you know, they will stay at your yeah. apartments and try and get a few thousand quid out of you just for stuff like that. Do you know what I mean? I, I had a kind of slightly similar experience in that one of our self-catering houses is a big old Victorian house overlooking Loch Long, um, you know, built in 1860. It's got this beautiful sweeping staircase that goes up. And you know those staircases where there's, you know, the, the corner, you go around the corner and it's thinner on the inside, yeah? They've been using them since Victorian time. So not that many people have had issues. Somebody a good few years ago tried to sue me because two of them had slipped down the stairs and that they claimed that the stairs were dangerous. Right. Now, A, there's a, per, you know, <laughs> it's just like, no, like I've welcomed thousands and thousands of guests. 99.999% yeah. of them have managed to walk down the stairs properly without slipping down them. But people, as you say, exactly that, go after you for money. I got sued once. I did literally get sued and taken to court because a guest had found eight mouse droppings in my Victorian house in the country. Oh she sued me for a ruined holiday and wanted 5,000 pounds. <laughs> and it's like- I took, her, I took her all the way to court. I'm not having any of that. Nobody's walking over me like that. As my dad said, he's a barrister. He said, she probably bought them with her, you know? <laughs> anyway, the, the I mean sheriff- the that sheriff was... took her out of court and told her she was wasting their time, so it was fine. Right, good, good. That was good to hear because I was going to ask what was the result was. But anyway, that was part of my reason for just after I got like four or five of these uh, apartments, they were all doing really well financially, making good profits and all the rest of it. I just couldn't cope with the demanding, okay. demanding people, and you know, like I can, I can tolerate like uh, tenants that are quite demanding and all the rest of it, but with like normal lets you know, standard letting, then you've got like a bit of time, you can sort things, you can get people, you can talk people around, but if people are only here for, you know, one or two nights, they're wanting things done instantly like that. It was too much pressure for me. And I would advise anybody, unless you're the type of person that's like fully hands-on, it's a hands-on business, or else you outsource it to a professional management agency who's doing everything for you know um, on your behalf then i would seriously consider it for from a mental health point of view it can be quite i think hard. that's really really good advice seriously good advice and also as i say in light of covid19 expectation management is a real thing now people want perfection immediately and god forbid it rains because if it rains their holiday is ruined. Nobody sued me for that yet. They've been miserable and it's all your fault because it's been raining. Go figure. So it's, you know, you have to really, you have to really like people. You have to be able to drop everything or have a project manager, you know, a, somebody property management company dealing with it. 
it is it's it's fully hands-on it's not an easy buck mm -hmm. and especially if you're in a city center now god forbid your neighbors find out you know because they, there's this campaign now where if a neighbor complains about your property the likelihood is you'll get an enforcement notice to desist trading so it's a thing you guys are really talking this strategy up <laughs> I know, right? But you see, I love it. I've just opened, well, three years ago, we opened our second property. I can't imagine doing anything else. I mean, it's fam it's fabulous. It's a yeah. great, it's a great industry. It really is. So I mean, I obviously see it from both ends. I see it from chief executive and grassroots doing the cleaning. Well, I don't do the cleaning, but you know, yeah, I wash the sheets. What, what, um, so what demand have you seen since kind of COVID-19 and, and the kind of lockdown restrictions have been easing? Have you seen huge demand and and obviously your, you and your members' um, property is going through the roof. Yeah, absolutely. I think because of the COVID cleaning protocols that we put together, we were able to um, assure Scottish government that we were a really safe place to stay. So we were able to open two weeks earlier than any other tourist accommodation last year. Um, people know because of those cleaning protocols that they're going to go to a property and it's going to be safe. And that's obviously critical right now. Mm. There was not one case of transmission in a cell catering property last year at all. And I've not heard of any this year, which is a pretty good track record. So you know that you're gonna come from your nice clean house to our nice clean houses and have a really nice safe holiday. You're not gonna to have to mix with other people. You're not gonna see the cleaners. You don't need to see the property owner unless you need them to do something, et cetera, et cetera. So, masses 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 of demand if you're a smaller property but of course so you know you try go booking a holiday right now it's virtually impossible but if you have a property that sleeps more or relies on more than one household then you are heavily impacted by household restrictions so for example you know even one of our properties sleeps 12 we, we're still closed totally closed because we rely heavily on multiple households so it's, it's, it's kind of a mix come with, sorry these new cleaning protocols i think i'm assuming they come with extra costs and i think that's been passed on to to the from inflated the price of the booking i i haven't i don't think it's sensible to do that the other thing is some people have increased prices exponentially apparently in cornwall you can't get anything for under three grand for a week um the difficulty was with, with that is are you really gonna meet those customer expectations? You know, if you're charging three grand, is it worth three grand? Yeah. Or was it 1200 last year? So what are they gonna do? They're gonna go, oh, we went to Cornwall. I'll use Cornwall as an example, not Scotland. Um, we went to Cornwall, it cost three grand, wasn't really worth it. We'll go back to Whitley next year. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think it's much more sensible to meet customer expectation, offer an amazing experience, and then they'll come back. No, absolutely. And I completely agree with that. I actually done a staycation a, um, a couple of weeks ago up near Inverness and um, one of the glamping pods for my doctor to get my daughter a lot of experience, but it's basically like glorified shed and it was 115 quid a night for it. And you're thinking, well, I'm sure I went to something similar a couple of years ago and it was 40 quid a night. So yeah, you can see the difference in prices just, just increasing, but it was nice. It was a pleasant experience and it was clean and stuff, but yeah, you can kind of see that you can see a lot of owners taking advantage of the opportunities right now with, with staycations booming. Yeah. And I, you know, I think it's, it's a dangerous, it's a dangerous line to walk on, really. Um, you've got to be very careful what you're doing with that sort of thing. But at the same time, people are prepared to spend money on a holiday at the moment, and they're more likely to spend it in a self catering property, because as you know, as I say, you've got that independence, you, you're not relying on a hotel, which isn't kind of being a hotel as you imagine it, you know, you don't have the same freedom and relaxation that you would normally have so you know yes masses of demand and again the the other the other part of the sector that's really hurting at the moment is obviously city centers people are less likely to be going into city centers so when people talk about self-catering booming at the moment yes some of them are but there's also elements of the sector that are really hurting mm -hmm. So I'm um, just going back on your points about obviously uh, neighbours and councils and obviously that was that was another thing that happened to me as well. I got reported by a neighbour. It was actually a group of neighbours. They got together like, and then they seriously went for me and they went all the way to the council, environmental health, all the rest of it. 
And before I, I knew it, I had the uh, environmental health officer contact me and then it was it all became a big thing. And I said, well, OK, it's fine. You know, I'll just close down and I basically shut it down. So what my question was, in terms of the regulation around Scotland, are there different local authorities, different councils that take a kind of harder line approach than others? Can you give examples at all? Yes. Now, this is the problem with any kind of regulation that's run by local authorities because you get 32 different versions. So we already know that Edinburgh Council is taking a very hard line on short term lets in tenement flats. If you don't have your own front door and you get um, an enforcement notice, the likelihood is you will no longer get planning permission. Now, five years ago, they would have turned around if there was a complaint, they would have identified what the issues were and they would have either said no there's been a material change of use therefore you need to get planning permission and then they wouldn't grant it to you or they would say no there's been no material change of use now five years ago they would have said there's been no material change of use because essentially short-term letting is residential in use you know whether I'm in the apartment for a week or 365 days a year it's the same residential use now they will automatically say there has been a material change of use and shut you down. So there's been there's been a change in tactic, um, although planning clearly hasn't changed. Now, they introduced in February the planning control zone legislation, which means a local authority can introduce a control zone if there is a demonstrable link between short term letting and loss of housing stock. What they haven't ascertained so far is how that's going to be introduced or implemented. So the good news is that we made that legislation mean that the local authority has to get um, acceptance from ministers to do it. They can't just lob a control zone onto the whole of Edinburgh. And from our point of view, you need to show the demonstrable problem, like how many short term lets are there? Because at the moment, it's all based on anecdote and narrative rather than data. So we've been pushing really heavily for a registration scheme because you surely can't give any kind of evidence unless you've got everybody registered. So much like the private housing registration, that's what we're asking for. Yeah. So um, like as a landlord, it. you need to be registered as a landlord, as a service yeah. accommodation or short term yeah. stay, self care, whatever you want to call it, you would need to be registered as well. Yeah, makes sense, right? With obviously mandatory health and safety. That is that's a proportionate, sensible scotland-wide solution that we're really pushing for we want that to be, be quite we're quite be quite screwed because a lot of landlords i'm assuming that would that would have a service called a short-term holiday let property would probably register with a local um, authority as a landlord so it's coming up as a private rental property but it's not it's actually a short-term rental so the, yeah. the statistics yeah. are probably quite wrong yes yeah. yeah so what we we're saying is we want a registration scheme with um, mandatory health and safety so we want all those amateur Airbnbs to have to register so that they know what they need to comply with so that they are safe and, and doing what everybody else is doing. What we don't need is 32 local authorities introducing a licensing scheme and everybody says, well, what's the big deal? What's the difference? The difference is a licensing scheme is an authorization scheme. It's a, I would like to do this, please may I? Yes or no. And you could get but rejected. So and this, is, this what the, is this what the Scottish Government are proposing, the SNP in that, which was going to come into effect, what, this year, but then they scrapped it, or what? It was put before Parliament in February and withdrawn because it was not fit for purpose. Can, can you just elaborate a little bit about exactly what they were proposing? They were proposing, they keep saying that it's a it's a licensing scheme and it's just to do with basic health and safety. So what's the big deal? That's not the point at all. The point is that it's going to cost about 1500 to 2000 pounds to get a license. And they might well say no. Whereas so a register- like having an HMO license, right? Similar sort of thing? Almost identical, only worse, because they're talking about monitoring fees. So basically, people can go in and monitor whether you're doing something or not. Now, that doesn't work when you've got guests. It's akin to, you know, saying somebody rocking up to the front of my self catering property, knocking on the door and checking whether that it's over occupied. Mm -hmm. You can't you can't do that when you've got guests. 
They're not tenants, they're guests. They're paying an awful lot of money for the privilege of staying there. So the difficulty was we raised this. So what they were trying to do is get it through with very little parliamentary scrutiny. We managed to raise it to the point where they got an awful lot of parliamentary scrutiny and it was withdrawn. So then they set about um, with a working group, which we are part of. The working group has met three times. The working group has made no material difference to the licensing proposals whatsoever. I think we have been misrepresented on the working group. I think it is a smokescreen and the guidance that has been drawn up as part of that working group, we have no part in. I will not put the ASSC's name to it. I will have nothing to do with it. The problem is it's got worse, not better. So they're now talking about elements of over-provision in as part of the licensing. So local authority now will have the ability to introduce a control zone, but also to decide on over-provision of short-term lets within their area. Now, how do you work out what that over-provision is if you don't know where the properties are because you don't have a register? How, how do you, if, if there are 12 in a street, who gets the license and who doesn't? Mm. Where, when does the over-provision start and stop? I mean, it's, it, it, it is a piece of legislation that is riddled with problems. And that's coming from a licensing lawyer. Just playing so devil's we, advocate here for a second, right, though, but if you introduce like a licensing thing, right, where, you know, landlords would need to make, a, I don't know what you call them, landlords, operators, probably operators, uh, yeah. would uh, need to basically bring their properties up to a certain standard, be checked out, make sure there were all fire regulations and all the rest of it. There, presumably there'd be some inspector that comes around as well. Is that not good for the industry? It's going to raise the standard. It's going to weed out those kind of amateur Airbnb people. Um, rate, bringing properties up to standard, I would hope is not the case because if you're getting guests to pay significant amounts of money, then your, the standard of your property has to be higher than, for example, an HMO. Otherwise, you're just simply not going to let it out. Um, yes, absolutely. The quality piece is really important and bringing things up to standards is really important. And if it weeds bad operators out, brilliant. Don't need to do that via licensing. And the thing is, the difficulty is, is that, for example, my two properties, I already spend a fortune on fire safety, all the compliance per year costs a fortune three and a half grand on insurance etc cetera, etc cetera. i don't want to spend another two thousand pounds on a license telling me that i'm doing all the things that i'm already doing i mean this legislation is not designed for traditional operators that are already doing it this is designed to weed out the bad operators well there's an easier way of doing that and a less con you know this is hugely burdensome for traditional operators that operate on a very small profit margin a lot of the time you know we're talking about micro businesses across the whole of scotland also let's not forget the burden on local authorities local authorities do not have the resource to do this they simply don't what we're asking for is a registration scheme which um is is a centralized system easy digital cheap and at that point everybody knows where the properties are at that point the fire service can go do a spot check mm -hmm local authority can go and do a spot check if there's an issue with noise or antisocial behavior they've got all the details they can close you down yeah you know, no, some... what it doesn't need what it doesn't need is a licensing officer to go knock, knock at the door when you've got guests in and 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 sh what are they going to do shut you down in the middle and then the other problem is that people don't realize is that if there's an issue with license being refused or revoked you're simply not going to be able to get advanced bookings that's like you going into a supermarket putting all your shopping in the shopping basket getting to check out and then going oh, i don't think no nah, i don't think we're going to sell that to you sorry can you put it all back mm. it doesn't work yeah. you know so i understand what they're trying to achieve but what they're not doing is listening to industry and understanding how to achieve it properly and do you think then potentially that could have quite serious damage to you know your industry if that if they brought about these these harsh kind of changes 100 percent. now what i would say is that licensing will materially damage tourism in scotland 
registration will materially improve and benefit tourism in Scotland. Okay, okay. And then <clears throat> another thing that I was uh, thinking about, you know, like, so, so what do you think the main motivation is with these politicians and their policies and things like that? You know, it, it, is it, does it stem from, you know, tenant groups saying that there's, you know, it, all these Airbnbs are creating a shortage of, um, you know, housing and, you know, it's pushing rents up within the city centre. Is that, is that a thing that's fueling it? Yeah. Yep. Any other totally things? That. But, no, but, you know, I, let's not forget that, that pushing house prices up is to do with gentrification, which has been happening since the 60s, way before Airbnb. You know, we're not talking about Airbnb fueling house price increases. That's simply not true. It's an easy narrative. Apart from anything else, what's fueling house prices in increasing and lack of housing is lack of house building. But it's much easier targeting a sector and trying to get rid of a bunch of them out of that sector than it is to actually address the key issue, which is a lack of housing. And also, if you look at, there are five times more empty homes in Scotland than there are um, self-catering units. So it's just, we're just being used as an easy scapegoat. It's terribly tedious. Yeah, you can tackle these, um... These issues before you start targeting a group. Yeah. 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 What, but uh, as I say, we're not anti regulation. We absolutely support health and safety and compliance 100%. But you don't need to introduce a draconian, regressive piece of legislation to do it. You simply don't. We've talked a lot about the holiday let market, right? Which is obviously a huge part of the, the industry. But what about things like, um, you know, contractors? So, Typically, I mean, when I was doing it, I would get, you know, a group of kind of workmen coming up from uh, England to fit out a shop or something like that in Glasgow City Centre, or they're working in some sort of roads, you know, laying cables for Virgin or something like that. Um, a lot of people are kind of more attracted to, I would say probably on the kind of landlord side of things like, like us are more attracted to that side of the market because it's kind of seen as a bit more kind of lower maintenance because the idea is that these guys are out doing a, or women are out doing a hard day's work they come in at night they're not really going to be picking up the phone to complain about little things they're just going to want to come back cook their dinner and go to bed sort of thing you know is that a, a trend that has been uh you know playing out is there more and more of this happening now I think there is, that absolutely is. And it's interesting because I hadn't really realized how big a part of the sector that is, you know, how big a market that is until last year and they introduced the household restrictions. And suddenly you weren't allowed people from multiple households in a self catering property. And a load of my members came to me and said, you need to get that changed because that is our market. You know, we have always welcomed workers. And as you say, they are, they can be slightly less maintenance. Um, and on the 31st of October last year, um, Scottish government rang me up and said, by the way, we've changed it. Yes, you can have the workers in, as long as there's only one per room and you follow various bits of compliance and, and cleanliness and cleaning protocols associated with it. And um, the response was astonishing from people. They were absolutely thrilled. It's been a real game changer. So yeah, no, it's a really it's a really good market for certain people, especially if you, you know, you're near a big building project, as you say, or if you're city centre and there's fit outs and and also for for those employees or employers, it's a great option. It's a way cheaper option than hotels. Yeah, Stephen's looking at Aberdeen, aren't you, Stephen, for the the, the contractor market possibly? Yeah, absolutely. Quite right. Quite. A lot of oil and gas workers coming back as the industry is picking back up and renewables coming to the city as well. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Great. I mean, really great market. Really great market if you've got anybody nearby. I mean, that's obviously not going to be necessarily as appropriate on Harris, for example. But, you know, and that's about that's about identifying your market, isn't it? Where do I want to set up? Who's my market going to be? Is it going to be families? Is it going to be workers? Is it going to be walkers? Is it going to be stag parties? And you take your business from there. Can you give people like, you know, maybe your, your, a quick, just just some fire tips for how to avoid these potential kind of disasters where you get these kind of residence associations or people complaining about you? You know, that's got to be one of the most common things, especially in city centres, 
probably obviously not in rural areas, but in city centres where you've got this kind of backlash from neighbours and that, is there any any quick tips you could give to people? Yeah, absolutely. It's about management. It's about communication and being nice to your neighbours and being neighbourly. So, for example, if you're intending to do it, go talk to your neighbours first. Or if you don't talk to your neighbours, send them a note. Be nice to them. In, put some noise monitoring devices in. You know, that would be my immediate tip is make sure that you've got noise monitoring devices, because if the neighbor then complains about noise, you have actual data to take to the local authority and say, no, I'm sorry, there is no evidence of additional noise. Because this is what a lot of neighbors do. They say, oh, there's parties and it's really noisy. But if you've got the evidence to prove that it isn't, then they don't have grounds to complain. Um, some people are complaining out of principle and that's kind of silly because you couldn't get rid of a student living upstairs. And frankly, you know, students ought to be worse behaved than self-catering guests. They were in my day anyway. Um, and the other thing is, you know, it's about management. It's about guest management. So you tell your guests what you're allowed to do and not allowed to do. You tell your guests not to have parties. You make sure that your guests don't arrive at five in the morning, et cetera, et cetera. It's about just responding to the needs of both the guests and the um and the neighbor so we've got a code of conduct which basically signposts to all of this stuff so it's a little bit like the highway code it signposts to legal compliance but also signposts to best practice which yeah. means that you, you know your neighbors don't have to complain if you run your business properly your neighbors shouldn't complain what about cctv cameras is that a bit intrusive would you say you can get yourself into hot water with that sort of thing yeah. definitely you need to really, really think about that. And you need to, if you have any kind of CCTV, you need to be signed up to the ICO and, you know. Yeah, all sorts. And of... you definitely can't put CCTV in communal areas because right. that then the neighbours really would have grounds to complain. Yeah. No, that's good points. Um, what, what can a, what, what does your members or your association get for the, for the membership? Like what kind of service do you provide? What do you offer? What kind of support do you offer to your members? Um, SSC membership only costs £129 a year, it's absolute buttons, and for that they get a dedicated membership secretary who can ask, you can ask any kind of, inf you know, any question. We've got guidance sheets about everything from pat testing to marketing to best practice to et cetera, et cetera. We've got loads of recorded webinars, again, just with really helpful guidance and information. Obviously, you've got us lobbying on your behalf constantly. Um, I really need to get out more. I, all I do is work. So, you know, over the last few years, few years, you know, COVID aside, I have been absolutely working so hard to make sure that A, this licensing doesn't come in. We've also looked at um, energy performance certificates. We've got tourist tax on the agenda again, you know, so I'm here to basically make sure that I support the sector in any way that it needs to be supported. Use all, there's also a, a marketing module. We've got a consumer facing website called Embrace Scotland, which we are hoping to redesign and re, um, reinvigorate in the next little while. And that way you can promote your property on there and it's a commission free booking platform. Uh -huh. So it's, you know, there's, there's loads and loads and loads of benefits. Yeah, it sounds like a great association to be in if you're in that sector and we'll, we'll post the link on the show notes um, to the to the website that'd be great i mean i think i think evidence of what we've done over the last year is that in november 2019 we had 632 members as of this morning we had 1389 so that kind of shows what we've done over the last year yeah and why it's so like a global pandemic to showcase what you really need to you need that support around you and the people lobbying for for the rights of yeah. your uh, your sector absolutely yeah well we managed to do things like you know we managed to get a bunch of extra funding that the scottish government wasn't initially originally we weren't going to get any covid support at all we managed to get that reversed we got an additional one million pound that was delivered via visit scotland um we got a larger self-catering property grant and then we also managed to get the council tax paying properties, both B&Bs and self-catering, the support that they needed as well. So we are listened to. Mm. Yeah, that's it. And that probably saved a lot of people, like you say, micro businesses in the, the, the sector. Yeah. 
Sounds Absolutely. like you've got your work cut out there anyway, Fiona. So we appreciate you spending the, the hour with us here. And obviously you're talking about getting out more. We'll get you out to at least a thousand of our listeners anyway. So uh, it's uh, it's good it's good exposure for you. So yeah, thanks very much. And thanks for taking the time to uh, chat to us today. My pleasure. Thank you very much indeed for inviting. And uh, yeah, anything I can do to help you guys, just let me know. So guys, I hope you enjoyed that interview with Fiona Campbell. I know myself and Nick did. It was a really good chat. Um, phenomenal, vast knowledge and experience in that sector. Yeah, brilliant. Really good. And thanks, Fiona, for coming on. So uh, if you've got a wee spare minute, as always, guys, really appreciate your support. Please head over to our Facebook page. Make sure you contribute, get involved in the discussion there. If you've got time, please leave us an Apple uh, review on the podcast and also screenshot the podcast on Instagram, tag myself and Stephen in it, and we'll get you out to our followers as well. So thanks again and speak to you next week. Thanks a lot, guys.